Okay, welcome back. And when I say welcome, I mean I'm sorry, because now we're going to start looking at instruction list programming. And I'm pretty sure most people are going to hate this. They're going to complain about this. They're going to work on it for, you know, hours and hours, and they're still just not going to get it. And that's because instruction list programming is really, 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 really strange and screwy. Unless you come from like, you know, working with old machine language, in which case this is kind of going to make sense to you. If you're used to any kind of modern programming, even graphical automation programming, or especially computer programming, what you're about to see is going to just absolutely suck buckets of peanut butter. So let's go ahead and jump into this and try to make it through. Don't get frustrated. Um, you're probably going to have to ask some questions or do a lot of experimentation. You're not going to find much support out there for this paradigm. What you are going to find is that almost nobody uses it because it's just terrible. <laughs> but um, okay, let's go ahead and just jump right in. I'm going to add an object and I'm going to add an IL and go ahead and hit OK. And I'm going to come into our PLC program, our structured text. And you can see right away, these two environments look identical. And that's because they're both simple textual environments. You just need to pay close attention to the top. Does the name have a PRGST or does it have a PRGIL at the end? That's going to make a big difference because these two paradigms and what you type into them is by no means uh, interchangeable. So. Let's go ahead and put in a call for our IL1, and then we'll just close this one down altogether so that it doesn't keep you know popping up in front of us and confusing us. Now, what does this thing look like? Well, the best way I can explain it is really just going to be to jump in and start typing. You're not going to see a lot of help or anything like that on these commands. In fact, what really gets terrible is I'm going to start with a command LD. And if I double click on LD and I try to pull up my help menu, it's going to tell me that LD means ladder diagram. Well, that's true. LD certainly does mean ladder diagram, but it's also a command inside of an instruction list. And I don't see that mentioned anywhere in the help menu. So whatever help you are used to having in the help menus, it doesn't seem to exist very much in here. And then if you go online and you try to search for, you know, reference material and stuff like that for instruction list programming, because nobody really uses it, you're not going to find any support. So your best bet in here is to play and practice and struggle to understand this stuff. So Let's try and play with this a little bit. And let me just show you. And yes, you are going to have to write a couple of different programs in here. So here we go. LD means load. So I'm going to start by loading some kind of value. And I will go ahead and load the value 3. OK, so now I'm loading a 3. And now that I've got a 3 loaded, Think of this as basically you've got a plate in front of your face where you would normally put some food. And you can only have one thing on this plate at a time. Well, this is kind of how this language works. So I just put a three on our plate. So now if I want to work with anything or if I want to refer to a value, what I'm going to be referring to is that three on my plate. So now that I have that three, maybe I want to store that into a variable. So I'm going to type st tab, and then I'm going to store that into, and I will call that var1. And now I can define my var1, and I'll go ahead and call that an int. And so now I've actually set variable 1. And then let's say maybe I want to multiply that by 3. So I'll come over here and type MUL. And actually, better than 3, let's multiply that by 9. OK. And then maybe I want to store that 
into something called variable two. So I'll define my VAR2, and I will call that a DINT as well, and hit OK. So right away, I created the number three, then I've stored that into variable one, and then I've multiplied that three by nine, and then I've stored that into variable two. So let's go ahead and log in. And it looks like I've got some kind of cool communication error. That's because I'm not in simulation mode yet. So now that I'm in simulation mode, let's log in and go ahead and run. And as soon as I do, you can see I've got a 3 for variable 1, and I've got a 27 for variable 2. So it worked. And that's how this programming language actually looks. Now, that's not even the half of it. It does get plenty more complicated. So let's figure out how we would actually do something useful. What if I wanted to create a timer in this environment? OK, let's go ahead and just clear all of this out. And we're going to go ahead and try to do a timer. So I'm going to start by creating a call to my timer, and that's how I would actually invoke it to update the data. And I'll call it time1, and we'll set that up as a TON. And then I'm going to come up here, and before I invoke my timer, of course I want to set the properties for that. So how do I do that? Well. Let's say I want a 20 second timer. So I'm going to start off with load, and then I'm going to load a time, and that's going to be T pound 20s. And now that I've loaded that, I can use ST to store that into time1.pt. Very good. And then I can go ahead and load true. So now I've got the value true loaded, that's a boolean, and I can store that into time1.in. And just like that, I've got a timer which we should be able to watch timing out. So let's go ahead and put this thing online. And here we can see our time1. I'm going to expand that before I run. And there we go. We've created a timer in an instruction list, and we've got that thing running. So that's what it takes. It's, you know, a little strange, but it's about to get stranger. Don't worry. Now, let's do something that is a little bit more complex. Let's jump around. So I'll go up here, and let's make some conditions on getting into this timer. So I'm going to start by loading a test bool, and that'll be just called T-E-S-T-B-O-O-L, and that's going to be a bool. So now is when, this is how you would actually look at like an input or test a value to see if it's open or closed. And then I'm going to conditionally jump to another label. So I'm going to type J-M-P-C, jump conditionally, and uh, we'll jump to timer. And I will come down here, and I will create a timer label. And I'll end that with a colon. So timer colon, and that's going to be all of this script right here. And if I don't jump to that timer, then I'm going to return. So I'm going to go back to my main program or wherever I was called into this routine for. So I'm only going to call my timer conditionally if my test bool happens to be true. <laughs> so let's load this thing up, run it, and now we're good. So we can expand our timer so we can watch it work. And I'm going to set my test bool to true. And there we go. Our timer starts working. And then if I set it to false, we're not checking the timer anymore, so it just pauses and stays there. 
And of course, I can pick right back up where I left off. Just like that. Okay, so that's kind of how this thing works. Let me jump back out of here. And aside from using those uh, conditional jumps, we also can do um, regular jumps. So instead of using a return here, I'll go ahead and just type a JMP and I'll jump into no timer. I can come down here and create a no timer label and end that with a colon. And here I can do something interesting like maybe I want to reset our timer. So I will load false and then I will store that into time one dot in and then from here I'll go ahead and return and the same thing from here if I run through this now that there's another label below even though I don't have a jump to this label I'm going to run right into that and just keep going well if I don't want that to happen I can go ahead and put a return here so it's either going to jump into timer or it's going to jump into no timer and then when it gets to timer it's going to run this and return it's going to you know not scan the rest of this program or if I get to no timer it's going to return and it's not going to scan the rest of this program and the last thing that I need to do since I'm affecting the timer I need to go ahead and do a call on the timer to update it so I'll go ahead and call time one alright so let's go ahead and test this one we're up and running let's check our timer and now we should see our timer being reset and fun things like that so let's fire our test bool and right away you see that we're timing up and then when I disable our test bool now we came down here and we made our timer energized false and we updated our timer therefore it automatically reset itself and I can come back over here and fire this again and there we go perfect so we can stop come offline and now imagine we wanted to scale something well we could certainly scale something we would have to create a scale object one of those lin trafos then we would need to set the parameters on that and you know, send it in an input and we could get an output so just like in structured text you can use all of those function blocks but you have to use this really strange step-by-step -step kind of means of doing it and everything you have to remember you can only have one thing on your plate at a time so whatever's on your plate if you want to store or update a value it's going to come from whatever you've already loaded LD onto your plate. If you want to drop that somewhere then you can store it. And I will go ahead and come back up to here and instead of loading test bool I will load the value 5 and I'm going to give a couple of different stores. So I'm going to store to I'll just call it int1 and that'll be an int got it and then I will also store to int2 and also call that an int got it so when I go online and I run this guy you can see whenever I set it both of those become five because even though I've already stored this thing in one place that doesn't mean it's not still on my plate it is on my plate until I put something else on my plate so if I have 10 other lines of different instructions under here and then I go back and I do a store again but I don't ever load anything else I'm still going to be working with the number five and let's go ahead and stop out of there now if I wanted something different I could go ahead and you know load a three and I should tab between there there we go 
And yeah, same thing. So if I fire this up, now I'm storing a 5 and then I'm storing a 3. So that is how this thing works. And with that little tiny brief intro, you've got enough to figure out the rest and write a program. Of course, you've also got a cheat sheet that you can download and that's going to help you. So, okay, that's tricky stuff. And once you actually really start trying to program with it, you're the only way that you're going to learn this is just by doing it. <laughs> so you, you can look at the different commands and expressions that are available to you. And whenever you jump in, it's going to be painful because, you know, we're not used to thinking in these terms and with this kind of process. But once you actually start forcing yourself to hack through a program, you'll get it and you still won't like it and you still won't see much advantage to it. And I will be the one sitting here saying, yeah, I kind of don't blame you. I hate it too. So at that, we'll go ahead and wrap and we'll come back in the next and jump into a project. See you then.